Hello, uh, good morning. Uh, could you all hear me? Yes, excellent. Um, it's great to be here, thank you, Niall. Thank you for organising this and thanks for the, for the introduction. Well done for those of you who've made it on time. It was a bit of a marathon getting here this morning, wasn't it? <laughs> so sorry. So, so the, the, sort of, the sort of pun my, my, my dad makes. But anyway, um, great that you're all here uh, and I'm looking forward to today. Um, I, I hope uh, what I have to present today uh, will make your trip worth it. I know for a fact uh, the other presenters will make your trip worth it, um, but I hope mine will also be of use and interest uh, to all of you. Now, before I get on with my presentation, I, I'd just like to say just a few, a few words about me and who I am and my background and so on and so forth. So, my name's James Davis. Uh, my doctorate was in uh, medical and social anthropology, focusing on mental health. And I've trained as a psychotherapist, an adult psychotherapist, and indeed practiced as a therapist in different organizations, uh, such as the NHS, and also for the organization uh, MIND. When I worked for the NHS, I worked in an outpatient psychotherapy unit, uh, receiving referrals from the wards and also from primary care. And it was while working in that setting that I started to become quite concerned with some of the more traditional forms of psychiatric intervention and practice that I was witness to. For example, when it came to psychiatric diagnoses, I often found that these diagnoses created the illusion of understanding among me and my peers. I also felt that these diagnoses were generating stigma in the people I was working with and also leading them to become confused about the real nature of their distress. When it came to the psychiatric medications, while it is true, and I certainly subscribe to this notion, that for some people, the most severely distressed members of our society, uh, these medications can be experienced as very useful, certainly when taken in the short term, and I accept that principle. For me, working in the NHS, it felt that there was a huge amount of unnecessary over-prescribing. And in addition to that, a lot of prescribing that was going on for far too long. Prescribing that ultimately, in my view, was doing more harm than good. So as a consequence of these experiences, which I culminated over a series of years, I started to read uh, voraciously uh, the critical psychiatry literature to find out a little bit more about what potentially could be going wrong. And after a few years of consulting this literature, I decided personally to make my own contribution to this particular canon. And I decided to do that by way of not writing an academic article for clinicians and for uh, fellow academics, but rather for writing the kind of book I felt the people I was seeing in the room might benefit from reading. So I wanted to write a book for the general reader in order to reach the people who were on the receiving end of psychiatric drugs and diagnoses. Because in my view, it felt that many such people were subjecting themselves to psychiatric interventions without having the satisfactory information in order to make an informed decision as to whether or not to subject themselves to this form of intervention. And that's why I decided to write the book I did, to provide them with that information I felt they needed in order to make an informed choice as to whether to subject themselves to these interventions or not. So that book, uh, that, that, that project culminated in a book called Cracked, Why Psychiatry is Doing More Harm Than Good. And I published that a few years ago. And when it was published, and I think still today, that book advanced a position that is both countercultural and counterintuitive. The position goes like this. That psychiatry over the last 30 years, under the dominance of the biomedical model, has started to become bad for our mental health. Now, there are a number of reasons why I argue this to be the case. Uh, I'm just going to focus on two quickly before focusing on one in particular in the first part of my lecture today. The first reason is that psychiatric drugs do not do what they say they do on the tin. 
they're more ineffectual and dangerous than many of us have been led to suppose. The second point is that the links between the pharmaceutical industry and psychiatry have become far too cosy in recent decades. And this has biased psychiatry towards privileging psychopharmaceutical treatments in the management of emotional distress. And indeed, that is the argument I'm going to focus on in particular in the second part of today's lecture. The final point I want to make, and this is the one I'm going to focus on in the first part of today's lecture, is that psychiatry has wrongly medicalised more and more people in contemporary society. So apparently, one in four of us now suffers from a mental health disorder in any given year. And I'm going to argue that this figure is so startlingly high because psychiatry has simply renamed more and more of our natural and normal, albeit painful, human experiences as indicating psychiatric disorders that oftentimes require some kind of psychiatric uh, drug. So in effect, by reclassifying painful normality as psychiatric abnormality, we have created the illusion of a psychiatric epidemic. Now, I'm not suggesting here, I'm not suggesting here that the suffering itself is illusory. No, that is absolutely real. It demands attention and it demands care. What I'm contesting is the notion that this suffering is psychiatric in nature. Okay. So, what is at the heart of this illusion? Well, I'm going to argue today that at the heart of this illusion sits a book called the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, the book that includes all of the mental disorders that psychiatry believes to exist. Now, there are many interesting things about this book, but one in particular that stands out for me is that this book has expanded at a faster rate than almost any other medical manual in history. So, for example, in the early 1960s, this book included around 100 disorders, whereas today it includes around 370. So what is going on? Well, that's the uh, question I set out to answer in part of uh, the book I was, I was writing, but I encountered an immediate problem, and it was this. There was very little documentary evidence chartering the processes that the committees who wrote DSM followed when they put that manual together. So I quickly realised, if I were to write some kind of reconstruction of events, then I would have to go and speak to the people who wrote DSM. And that's what I did. I started with someone called Dr Robert Spitzer, who's now generally regarded to be the most influential psychiatrist of the 20th century, because he was chairperson of DSM-3, published in 1980. He headed of a team of around nine people, which was called the task force, remember that phrase, the task force, who wrote and put that manual together. Now, the reason I'm going to start with DSM-3 today, and by the way, there have been five editions of DSM over its history, the, the most recent being DSM-5, published in May uh, 2013. But the reason I'm going to start with DSM-3 is because, by far, it is the most important edition in the manual's history for the following reasons. It established the modern diagnostic system under which we still operate today. So it's, we, we, we call it the checklist system. If you experience this number of symptoms for this amount of time, then you warrant this diagnosis, right? That checklist system was created uh, in DSM-3. Number two, DSM-3 introduced 80 brand new mental disorders, many of the household name disorders with which you may be familiar. Disorders like attention deficit disorder, or post-traumatic stress disorder, or major depression, etc., and so forth. And finally, DSM-3 uh, significantly lowered the bar 
for what constitutes having one of these disorders. In other words, it made it far easier to get diagnosed with a psychiatric disorder. So for these reasons, I'm going to focus on DSM-3 first before moving on to DSM-4. Uh, but before I get to that, um, I just want to say for a moment, in what I'm about to present to you now, this is a composite of the interview data I gathered from speaking to the leading members of the DSM task force, the interviews I conducted with them, and also the archival research I undertook at the American Psychiatric Association in Washington, D.C., where they house all of the DSM documents, the documents pertaining to uh, the construction of DSM, and I've made two separate trips to those archives in order to familiarize myself with those documents. But let me just, um, before I get to that data, first set the scene. So I'll just tell you a, a brief story. Um, a few years ago, I'm in my office um, at the University of Roehampton, and I, you know, it really strikes me, I really need to speak to this guy called Dr. Robert Spitzer. So I think, well, look, let me go online, let me find his, let me find his telephone number. So I search online, and I, and I find this number, and I think, right, I'll give it a call. So I give him a call from my office in London, and this lady answers the phone. And I just kind of assume, rightly or wrongly, I assume that it's, it's his secretary. Uh, so I say, oh, hello, my name's Dr. James Davis. So I'm, I'm calling from London. I, I'd love to be able to book an appointment to speak to uh, Professor Robert Spitzer at some point. Would that be possible? And then she, she, she responds by saying, hold, hold on, hold on. Robert? Robert? What have you won? And I'm like, what? what? This, is, this is not what I, <laughs> what I expected. And she goes, someone on the phone. And by the way, I'm not going to do any more American accents uh, for the rest of the day. <laughs> and suddenly, this, hello? Oh, OK, that, just that, that one, that's it. <laughs> and it's Robert Spitzer. And I say, oh, hi, um, yeah, well, I'm, 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 uh, I'm James Davis. Uh, I'd like to interview you. And, and it, so he says, well, what do you want to know? Let's have a conversation now. So I said, well, can I, can, I, can I record this? Yeah, fine. So I get my computer and I da 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 da. And we have a conversation for an hour, off the cuff. At the end of that conversation, I say to him, listen, Robert, this has been absolutely fascinating. Do you mind if we carry on this conversation? I'll come to the US. Why don't I come to the US and meet you and we'll carry on this conversation? And he said, fine. Uh, just let me know when and we'll arrange it. So I go to my head of department, I say, listen, I've got to speak to this guy, could you fund the trip? And they say, fine, we'll fund the trip. So I, I head off to the United States six months later. So six months later, I get on a train uh, from New York City, take the train out through New Jersey to Princeton University. Uh, and Robert Spitzer uh, now lives in, in one of those lovely New England homes just northeast of the university. So I get a, a, I get a cab. And I head out there, and the cab pulls up outside, and it's this beautiful old home, and it's, it's clear they've chosen a lovely place to live. I walk up to the, to the front door, I knock on the door, and Robert Spitzer opens the door. And he's standing there, and he's got this loose sports top on, he's wearing shorts, and he's wearing sandals, and he says, James, James, coming in. And one of the first things he says is, James, do you want to stay for lunch? And now, I just had one of those mountainous American breakfasts, you know? <laughs> I thought, oh, no. So I say, yes, that would be nice. And he said, to my great relief, look, before, before we have lunch, why don't we sit down so I can tell you what you want to know? So I go into his living room, we sit down, I set up my computer, I press record, and off we go. Now, one of the first uh, questions I had for Robert Spitzer was this. What was the rationale for this huge expansion of the DSM that happened under your watch. Remember, 80 brand new mental disorders went into that manual. What was the rationale for that? And this is how he responded. The disorders we included weren't really new to the field. They were mainly diagnoses that clinicians used in practice, but which weren't recognized by the DSM. So by including them in the DSM, we gave them professional recognition. So presumably these disorders had been discovered in a biological sense. That's why they were included, right? No, not at all. There are only a handful of mental disorders in the DSM known to have a clear biological cause. These are known as the organic disorders. These are few and far between. So let me get this clear. 
there are no discovered biological causes for many of the remaining mental disorders in the DSM. It's not for many, it's for any. No biological markers have been identified. Now, let me just say something here for a moment. Now, the reason why this may sound strange to many people, maybe not necessarily people in this room, but people out there in wider society, is because people expect psychiatry to work much like the rest of modern mainstream medicine. In modern mainstream medicine, and of course there are exceptions to this, but broadly speaking, a name will only be ratified as indicating the existence of a disorder after some kind of pathological roots have been discovered in the body, in the cells, in the tissues, in the organs, etc. But the surprising thing about psychiatry is that it works in completely the opposite way. Psychiatry first names a disorder before any pathological roots have been discovered in the body. So in effect, a new mental disorder can make it into the DSM and become part of our wider culture, even though there is no biological evidence whatsoever to support its inclusion. So I continued. So if there are known known biological causes, on what grounds do mental disorders make it into the DSM? What other evidence supports their inclusion? Well, psychiatry has to look for other things, behavioral, psychological. We have other procedures. I then asked him what these procedures were. I guess our general principle was that if a large enough number of clinicians felt that a diagnostic concept was important in their work, then we were likely to add it as a new category. That was essentially it. It became a question of how much consensus there was to recognise and include a particular disorder. So it was agreement that determined what went into the DSM. That was essentially how it went. Right. Another point uh, to make here, agreement does not constitute scientific proof, right? If a group of theologians all get together and agree that God exists, this doesn't prove that God exists. All it proves is that this group of theologians believe it does. So in what sense is DSM committee agreement different? Why, when a group of psychiatrists comes together and agrees upon something, should the rest of us accept they have got it right? Well, the obvious answer to that question would be, well, surely there are other forms of research that are guiding the committee in the agreements they reach, and that would be fair enough. So let me deal with that point now, and let me deal with it by drawing into the conversation a professor of psychology at Harvard Kennedy School, someone called Paula J. Kaplan. Now, Paula is very interesting because she was a consultant to DSM-3, but more importantly because she lobbied Robert Spitzer not to include a new disorder that was proposed for inclusion. This disorder was called self-defeating personality disorder or SDPD for short. Now she argued that this diagnosis was very dangerous because the characteristics of SDPD were very similar to the characteristics that women displayed when they had been victims of violence. So in other words, she argued that this diagnosis could be used to pathologize female victims of violence. They were suffering because they had a self-defeating personality disorder, not because they've just been abused. But also, it could let the perpetrators of such violence off the hook because presumably they were just doing what these women wanted. The women had a self-defeating personality disorder. The, the men or whomever the abusers were, were simply obliging. So for this reason, she argued it was a dangerous diagnosis and it shouldn't be included. But Spitzer remained adamant. He did not want to uh, get rid of the diagnosis. And when, when I was um, at the DSM archives in Washington, D.C., by the way, there were nine lineal feet of documents there. 
Um, I'm sifting through a box and I find this little tag which reads SDPD. And I go down and I pull out this document and I find the very meeting in which Robert Spitzer and his team are discussing Paula J. Kaplan's argument. And I'm just going to show you a transcript of that minuted meeting here, verbatim, because I think it's quite interesting. It says the following. They, the women, present a narrow-gauged but persuasive argument. Their powerful argument is that it is a political hot potato. The feminist issue is a false one that this diagnosis could pathologize female victims of violence. Think, women's arguments seem irrelevant to questions on the table. They are obscuring their own good arguments. The good arguments being that SDPD is a controversial diagnosis, the irrelevant arguments being those posed by Kaplan. Benedek, no empirical basis for category, but you're right, arguments aren't responsive to questions. Rose. We do great disservice by backing off and not acknowledging that this pattern is pathological. So from this, you, you see they're saying, no, no, we're going to keep it in the DSM. And they do keep us in the DSM. But in a last ditch attempt to try and influence them against doing this, Paula J. Kaplan launches on the final strategy. I decide to scrutinise thoroughly the very research used to justify including SDPD in the DSM. Let's have a look now at what she found. Firstly, she found only two pieces of research, which is a remarkably small amount by anyone's standards. But now let's have a look at what that research constitutes. In the first piece of research, which was conducted by Robert Spitzer, a group of psychiatrists at only one university who all accepted that SDPD existed were shown some old clinical case studies. Kaplan pointed out that just because some psychiatrists at one hospital all diagnosed their patients with SDPD was not proof that the disorder actually exists. All it proves, as Kaplan said, is that a group of psychiatrists working at the same institution, gave the same label, rightly or wrongly, to a given set of behaviours. It proves nothing more than that. But if you think that first piece of research is weak, then just consider the second piece. A questionnaire was sent to a selected number of members of the American Psychiatric Association. This asked them whether the diagnosis SDPD should be included in the DSM. An official report later conducted by the psychologists Cutchins and Kirch showed that only 11% voted yes, which is surely not a representative sample of the psychiatric community. So that is the research basis for including SDPD in the DSM. Now you could say to me, look James, Fair enough, but look, surely this is an outlier. You're cherry-picking the most extreme example in order to rubbish the whole process. That's what you're doing. The research basis for the other's disorders was far more robust. Now, if you were to make that argument, that would be a fair argument to make. So let me deal with it now. And I'm going to deal with it by inviting into the discussion somebody called Dr. Theodore Millen. And by the way, Dr. Theodore Millen was a member of the original task force, so he was privy to everything that went on. In the following quote, this is what he says about the research not only supporting the inclusion of SDPD, but all of the other disorders that went into DSM. This is what he says. There was very little systematic research, and much of the research that existed was really a hodgepodge scattered, inconsistent, and ambiguous. I think the majority of us recognize that the amount of good, solid science upon which we were making our decisions was pretty modest. So let me now go back to sitting in Robert Spitzer's front room back in Princeton. I decide to read to Robert this quote to see what he made of it. And after a short and a slightly uncomfortable silence, Robert Spitzer responded in a way I simply had not expected. He said the following. 
Well, it is certainly true that for many of the disorders that were added, there wasn't a tremendous amount of research. And certainly there wasn't research on the particular way we define these disorders. In the case of Millen's quote, I think he's mainly referring to the personality disorders. But again, it is certainly true that the amount of research validating data on most psychiatric disorders is very limited indeed. So you're saying that there was little research not only supporting your inclusion of new disorders, but also supporting how these disorders should be defined? There are very few disorders whose definition was a result of specific research data. So, I was so surprised by this admission that when I returned to the UK some days later, I decided to check it out with other members of his task force. So on a sort of rainy English morning, I decided to call at his office in New York City someone called Professor Donald Klein. Now, Professor Donald Klein is a really important figure in the history of DSM. He was second in command to Robert Spitzer, but actually from the archives, it turns out he probably had, in many areas, almost more influence than Robert Spitzer. So a key player in the history of DSM. I called him and I read to him what Spitzer had said to me to see what he made of it. And this is how he responded. Sure, we had very little in the way of data. So we were forced to rely on clinical consensus, which admittedly is a very poor way to do things. But it was better than anything else we had. So without data to guide you, how was this consensus reached? I asked for an example. We thrashed it out, basically. We had a three hour argument. There would be about 12 people sitting down at a table. Usually there was a chairperson and there was somebody taking notes. And at the end of each meeting, there would be a distribution of events. And at the next meeting, some would agree with the inclusion and others would continue arguing. If people were still divided, the matter would be eventually decided by a vote. A vote? Really? Sure, that is how it went. Right, so they're voting here. I'm interested. <laughs> So the next person I speak to, Dr. Henry Pinsker, again, a, a member of the original nine, I decide to raise the issue of voting with him. And this is what he said. Some things were discussed over a number of different meetings, which would sometimes be followed by an exchange of memoranda about it. And then there would simply be a vote. vote. People would raise hands. There weren't that many people. Regarding the legitimacy of this method, Pinsker continued, we never had any question that that was how we should proceed. I had no reservations at all about working that way. And just to confirm this was the case, um, when I was in the archives, I managed to source with the archivist 12 minuted task force meetings. And we could only source 12 because that's all we could find. And out of those 12 minute task force meetings, there is evidence, clear evidence, of votes taking place in 10 of them. And we're not talking about one or two votes here. Lots and lots of votes on a whole host of different topics. In one of the documents, there was about 24 votes on loads of different things. How to define the disorders, where to set symptom thresholds, whether or not to include the disorders. In other words, the archival evidence absolutely supports what the oral history is saying. Oh, one, one point I just want to make about all of this. Voting isn't a scientific activity. <laughs> it's a, it, it, you know, it, what is it? It's a cultural activity. When anything is voted into existence, whatever it may be, whether it's a new president of the United States, whether it's a new union leader, whether or not it's a new mental disorder, the likelihood we've got it wrong is never far away. Okay, so let me give you... Ah, oh, yes. Uh, could I just introduce you to Rennie Garfinkel for a moment? Very interesting uh, uh, woman. She um, 
During the construction of DSM-3, she just finished her training as a psychologist. So she was very young, very green, very naive and innocent, as we all are before we go out there into the big wide world. And she got a kind of internship at the APA, and she turned up uh, one morning and she said, what do I have to do? And they said, oh, there's this, this thing going on upstairs called the DSM. Could you go up there and just help out, make coffee, photocopy, usual sorts of things? So, yeah, fine. So she goes up there. She doesn't know what she's part of. And she's sitting in the task force meetings. And as things roll on, she starts to realise she's actually part of something quite important here. And she's privy to some quite fascinating dynamics. So, 30 or so years later, I decide to interview her. What was going on? What was happening? What did you observe? This is what she said. You must understand, what I saw happening on these committees wasn't scientific. It more resembled a group of friends trying to decide where they want to go for dinner. One person says, I feel like Chinese food. Another person says, no, 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 I'm really more in the mood for Indian food. And finally, after some discussion and collaborative give and take, they all decide to go have Italian. <laughs> she then gave me an example of how far down the scale of intellectual respectability she felt these meetings could sometimes fall. On one occasion, I was sitting in on a task force meeting, and there was a discussion about whether a particular behaviour should be classed as a symptom of a particular disorder. And as the conversation went on, to my great astonishment, one task force member suddenly piped up. Oh, no, 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 we can't include that behaviour as a symptom, because I do that. <laughs> and so it was decided that that behaviour wouldn't be included, because presumably if someone on the task force does it, it must be perfectly normal. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, let me just give you some more impressions of these, these, these meetings gathered by way of my interviews and other people, um, um, other sources I consulted. According to other members of the task force, these meetings were often haphazard affairs. Suddenly these things would happen and there didn't seem to be much basis for it except someone just decided all of a sudden to run with it, said one participant. It seemed, another member admitted, that the loudest voices usually won out with no extensive data one could turn to, the outcome of task force decisions often depended on who in the room had the strongest personality. But the problem with relying on consensus, reiterated Garfinkel, is that in the discussion, some voices will just get quieter, either because they don't want to fight or because they see they're in the minority and snap. That's when the decision is made. Admittedly, when the task force lacked expertise on a particular disorder, Spitzer would consult the relevant leaders in the field, and the archives are full of these letters he was writing back and forth to, to um, the experts. But this also led to chaotic meetings that members often found difficult to participate in. One of the only British members of the task force, a psychiatrist called David Schaffer, recalled how such meetings often unfolded. In these meetings of the so-called experts or advisors, people would be standing and sitting and moving around. People would talk on top of each other, but Bob, Robert Spitzer, would be too busy typing notes to chair the meeting in an orderly way. Now, in uh, 2005, a very interesting article was published in the New Yorker magazine. And the title of that uh, article was A Dictionary of Disorder. And it was a biographical study of Robert Spitzer's influence on global psychiatry. And midway through that article, there's a section on the construction of DSM-3, which I just want to read to you very briefly. Roger Peel and Paul Asada. Psychiatrists at St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. wrote a paper in which they used the term hysterical psychoses to describe the behaviour of two kinds of patients they had observed. Spitzer read the paper and asked Peel and Lusada if he could come to Washington to meet them. During a 40-minute conversation, the three decided that hysterical psychoses should really be divided into two disorders, brief reactive psychosis and factitious disorder. Then Bob asked for a typewriter, Peel says. To Peel's surprise, Spitzer drafted the definitions on the spot. 
He banged out criteria sets for factitious disorder and for brief reactive psychosis, and it struck me that this was a productive fellow. He comes in to talk about an issue and walks away with diagnostic criteria for two different mental disorders. And by the way, both of those disorders went into the DSM with only very minor modification from the original criteria written up there and then in that room. Let me just read you two paragraphs before we move on. As Spitzer's DSM-3 was published in 1980, it became a sensation overnight. The almost 500-page long manual sold out immediately. The manual was purchased not only by uh, psychiatrists, but by nurses, social workers, lawyers, psychologists, psychotherapists, etc. And the enthusiasm quickly spread far beyond the United States. In Britain, for example, the manual had such impact that by the end of the 1980s, most British psychiatrists were being trained to use DSM. Furthermore, Spitzer's DSM categories quickly became those that guided all research into psychiatric disorders internationally. This meant that the disorders that were studied by researchers in Germany, Australia, Canada, Britain, Scandinavia, and so on and so forth, were those defined and listed in Spitzer's DSM. In short, the book ultimately changed the fundamental nature of research and practice within the field, not to mention the lives of tens or countless millions diagnosed with the psychiatric disorders listed therein. And yet, as the influence of the manual spread, the truth about its construction remained obscure. Most professionals using the manual simply did not know, and I would say still do not know today, the extent to which biological evidence or solid research failed to guide the choices the task force made. They did not know that the definitions of the disorders contrived, the validity of the disorders included, and the symptom thresholds people must meet in order to receive the diagnosis were not decided on the basis of rigorous research, but were the product of committee decisions which, at best, reflected the well-meaning professional opinions of a small subset of psychiatrists. In short, most people did not know that the fundamental changes Spitzer brought to global psychiatry only required the consensus of an extremely small group of people nine people. And indeed, as Robert Spitzer openly confirmed to me in our interview, and, I, and actually I think this is, this is my, my favourite quote uh, of all, he said the following, Our team was certainly not typical of the psychiatric community, and that was one of the major arguments against DSM-3. It allowed a small group with a particular viewpoint to take over psychiatry and change it in a fundamental way. What did you make of that criticism? What did I make of that charge? Well, it was absolutely true. It was a revolution, that's what it was. We took over because we had the power. Quite a striking confession. I actually, I actually got that um, quote uh, the day after I was leaving and I was at the hotel and I was having breakfast the day after I interviewed and I was really frustrated with myself because there were two or three questions I just didn't get in to the interview. So I thought, you know what, just call him. This guy usually answers the phone, so just call him. So I, I called him back and, and I said, I'm so sorry, Robert, a couple of things I just want to ask, which I forgot. And he said, go ahead, go ahead, what are they, what are they? And I asked him about the criticisms of DSM, and this is what he said. And I, I recorded this on a fountain outside of one of those, you know, best ins or something, you know, uh, sitting there, and I recorded it there, and this is what he said to me uh, that morning. And I think it's really, really quite a powerful statement, because it's true. It's absolutely true. So much, another point I just want you to make here, so much of what goes on in mental health is to do with who has the power. 
It is absolutely to do with who has the power. And don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Shocking the extent to which this happens, not just on DS, but on all the committees that define how we are meant to understand and respond to emotional difficulties. Okay. All right. Um, I've got 10 minutes left of this section. Is that okay before we have a, a quick break? Because I want to move forward now into DSM-4. So not that much more to go, but, but stay with me, um, please. So in 1994, DSM-4 reaches the end of its shelf life and is replaced DSM-3, sorry, and is replaced by DSM-4, which remains the DSM in use for 20 years, right up until May 2013, when it's replaced by DSM-5. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in uh, 2013, I had the opportunity to talk to, interview the new chairperson of DSM-4, Dr. Alan Francis, who took over from Robert Spitzer, on two separate occasions. And so I, the first, one of the first questions I had to him was, with the benefit of hindsight, was there anything you did when constructing DSM-4 that you now regret? And this is what he had to say. Well, the first thing I have to say about that is that DSM-4 was a remarkably unambitious and modest effort to stabilize psychiatric diagnosis, not to create new problems. This meant keeping the introduction of new disorders to an absolute minimum. What did he mean by that? Well, his team only introduced eight new mental disorders into the main manual, which is a modest amount compared to the 80 introduced by Spitzer. However, from another standpoint, this claim to modesty is very shaky because it excludes the following. His team actually created 30 new mental disorders, but put them in the appendix and subdivided many existing conditions, in effect, creating new ones. So if you count the appendix inclusions and the subdivisions, all of which people can and are diagnosed with, then his team expanded the DSM from around 270 disorders to around 370 disorders, which is the very opposite of modesty and conservatism. So we carried on. Yet despite that conservatism, Francis said, and I let the comment slip, we learned some pretty tough lessons. We learned overall that even if you make minimal changes to the DSM, the way the world uses the manual is not always the way you intended it to be used. Can I just pick up on that just for one moment? I'm sorry I have to, but the way the world uses the manual. So it's the world who's at fault, right? If there are any men mental health professionals here in the room who in good faith use these manuals and you do in good faith, it's your fault. It's not their fault, it's your fault, by the way. Okay, so the way the world uses the manual is not always the way intended it to be used. For instance, we added bipolar 2, Asperger's disorder, and finally we added ADHD. And well, these decisions help promote three false epidemics in psychiatry. I asked him what he meant by that. Well, we now have a rate of autism that is 20 times what it was 15 years ago. By adding bipolar 2, a milder version of bipolar, we also doubled the ratio of bipolar versus unipolar depression, resulting in lots more use of antipsychotic and mood stabilizer drugs. Rates of ADHD also tripled, partly because new drug treatments were released that were aggressively marketed. So every decision you make has a trade-off, and you can't assume the way you write the DSM will be the way it will be used. There he goes again. So the way the DSM is being used has led to the medicalization of a number of people who really don't warrant their diagnoses. Exactly. Can you put a figure on how many people have been wrongly medicalized? There is no right answer to who should be diagnosed. There is no gold standard for psychiatric diagnosis. So it's impossible to know for sure. But when the diagnosis rates triple, over the course of 15 years, my assumption is that medicalization is going on. 
powerful statement for him to make. He was the chairperson of DSM-4. But could the situation be even worse than this? I would argue absolutely it could be, and it is. Because he's only talking about the eight disorders he put into the main manual. He's not talking about the subdivisions and the appendix inclusions, all of which medicalize more and more painful normality. He's also not talking about the existing problem of over-medicalization. He allowed to live on, created by DSM-3, allowed to live on into DSM-4, right? He allowed DSM-3 to carry on. He's not talking about that either. Think of some of the disorders he allowed to live on. We had disorders like female orgasmic disorder. Yeah. <laughs> Caffeine-related disorders. Stammering, stuttering, transsexualism, oppositional defiant disorder, which is something I evidently acutely suffer from. <laughs> Look, nobody is suggesting that these things aren't experienced as problems by certain people. I'm sure they are. But whether or not they constitute psychiatric illnesses is another matter entirely. So my final question for Alan Francis was this. With the benefit of hindsight, why isn't it you just simply scrapped a lot of what went on before? On the basis of number one, it enjoyed woeful scientific support. And on the number, basis number two, that it was many of this stuff, much of this stuff was frankly eccentric. And this is how he responded. If we were going to either add new diagnoses or eliminate existing ones, there had to be substantial scientific evidence to support that decision. And there simply wasn't. So by following our own conservative rules, we couldn't reduce the system any more than we could increase it. Now, you could argue that that is a questionable approach, but we felt it was important to stabilize the system and not make arbitrary decisions in either direction. But one of the problems with proceeding in that way, I said, is that it assumes the DSM system you inherited from Spitzer was fit for purpose. For example, it assumes that the disorders Spitzer included and the diagnostic threshold Spitzer's team set were themselves scientifically established. We did not assume that at all. We knew that everything that came before was arbitrary. Francis quickly corrects himself. We knew that most decisions that came before were arbitrary. I had been involved in DSM-3. I understood its limitations probably more than most people did, but the most important value at that time was to stabilize the system, not change it arbitrarily. So you are essentially saying that you set out to stabilize the arbitrary decisions that were made during the construction of DSM-3? In other words, corrected Francis, it felt better to stabilize the existing arbitrary decisions than to create a whole new assortment of new ones. And I thought that was a very good place to bring the interview to a close. <laughs> All right, so um, let me, one final paragraph before we have a very uh, short break. So drawing this part of the lecture to a close, what I have discussed today, I believe poses a serious challenge to those who embrace the conventional view that mental disorders are discrete patterns of biologically rooted pathological feeling and behavior identified by way of objective research processes. What an inspection of the construction of DSM rather reveals is that the separate disorders into which DSM organized diverse behavioral and mental phenomena were largely the outcome of vote-based judgments settled by a small, culturally homogenous subset of mental health professionals who were socially positioned at a given time to have their judgments ratified by the institutional apparatus of the American Psychiatric Association. Now, while such judgments may indicate that a group of professionals sharing similar socio-cultural beliefs, 
biases, persuasions and interests may see some things in the same way at a given point in time. They do not confirm that what they see is either objectively true, universal or indeed stable in er any verifiable sense. Uh, we're going to move on to a slightly different territory now in the second part. So in the first part we looked at the construction of DSM and the argument was essentially that we've expanded the definition of mental disorder to encompass more and more domains of human experience. Now one of the consequences of that of course is that we've created a larger and larger market for psychopharmaceutical medications, right? Because the more people out there in society who are disordered, the more people out there who are gonna need treatments. Now, this has happened in an era when there has been a dearth of psycho-social um, alternative provision. So the inevitable consequence of that has been more and more prescribing as a consequence of more and more over-medicalization. Let me just give you uh, a sense of scale. Uh, last year in the NHS, 500,000 people were given psychological therapy as an intervention. Last year in the NHS, 7.4 million people were prescribed an antidepressant. So you can see the imbalance in provision here. This is made all the more concerning given that the research shows that when people go to see their GP because they're suffering from emotional problems or acute emotional distress, the vast majority of those people actually want some kind of psychological or social intervention, not an antidepressant. But what they invariably get is an antidepressant because provision for the alternatives are at an all-time... Well, they're actually better than it was, but it's still, comparatively speaking, very low. And this can partly explain why, and I want you, this statistic to, to stay with you, um, over 20% of the adult population in England was prescribed a psychiatric drug last year alone. Over 20% of the adult population of England was prescribed a psychiatric drug. 16% were prescribed antidepressants, the rest antipsychotics, stimulants, uh, anxiolytics, etc., and so forth. And this figure has doubled in the last 15 years. In addition to that, not only are we prescribing double the amount of drugs we did to 15 years ago, but the average duration of time a person spends, for example, on an antidepressant has also doubled. Ten years ago, it was about a year. Today, it is around two years. In fact, half of all antidepressant users in England have been taking antidepressants for at least two years. So not only is prescribing going up, but we're staying on the drugs for longer and longer. And this is particularly concerning given the following facts, that long-term use is not associated with good stuff. Okay? Increased severe side effects, the impairment of autonomy and resilience, increased weight gain, worsening outcomes for some people, poor long-term outcomes for major depressive disorder, greater relapse rates, increased mortality, and an increased risk of developing neurodegenerative diseases such as dementia. So we should be concerned about these current trends, this epidemic of overprescribing. So how then does the relationship between over-medicalization, which manuals like DSM have encouraged, and rising drug consumption actually operate? What mechanisms of influence does industry exert to expand psychiatric drug consumption via over-medicalization? Putting it in the least varnished terms, how do pharmaceutical companies influence processes of medicalization to aid wider consumption of their products? And in order to address this question head on, I want to distinguish momentarily 
between two different forms of pharmaceutical industry influence, which we will call direct influence and indirect influence. So focusing firstly on direct influence, here's a definition of what that would mean. The undertaking of activities explicitly designed to increase psychiatric prescribing, such as direct marketing and advertising initiatives to both the public and the medical establishment. Fortunately, in the UK, um, it's illegal to market drugs to the general public. It's not illegal in the US, it's not illegal in New Zealand, but here it is. But pharma companies nevertheless invest heavily in marketing campaigns targeting professionals, uh, psychiatrists and medical professionals. And that goes on very widely. But allow me for a moment just to give you an illustration of direct marketing to the consumer. And this uh, concerns uh, a, a new diagnosis that was introduced into the DSM-4 in the year 2000. And this diagnosis was called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Apparently, up to 8% of women were said to suffer from the condition, and its main symptoms occurred two weeks before menstruation. And the symptoms included things such as feelings of fatigue, anxiety, emotional instability, distress in daily activities, and difficulty in concentrating. In short, premenstrual dysphoric disorder was a slightly mitigated version of PMT, premenstrual tension. Now, by the early 2000s, the number of women being diagnosed with premenstrual dysphoric disorder went up exponentially. And one of the key reasons for this was that the pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly had begun investing tens of millions of dollars promoting this so-called disorder and its so-called corrective, something they called Seraphem. And what I want to show you now is one of the commercials with which Eli Lilly was flooding the airwaves during this time. There are about four commercials in total. This was one of them. This was, this was perhaps the most popular one. Let me just play it to you. Okay, hands up the women in this room that uh, don't have premenstrual dysphoric disorder. <laughs> I mean, really. I mean, we're talking about the over medicalization of normality. I mean, this is astonishing, is it not? And this is just one of four commercials that were going around the United States at that time promoting Seraphim as a drug for a presumed, a presumed uh, mental disorder. Now, I just want to stay with this commercial just for a little while longer because there are a couple of other interesting things that need to be said about it. First, the word seraphim. Uh, interesting, is it not? It's a Hebrew play on the word seraphim, a word with female associations attached. Also, think of the packaging used. Um, this particular pill, seraphim, was encased in a very pretty pink and lavender pill, and so was the packaging in these sort of traditionally uh, female uh, symbolism. This is all standard fare of marketing, uh, but what I'm about to tell you now actually gets far more interesting. What Eli Lilly initially concealed from the hundreds of thousands of women who started to take Seraphim 
was that Seraphim is actually Prozac. Prozac and Seraphim are both made by Eli Lilly and chemically they are exactly the same. Hundreds of thousands of women were taking Prozac and they didn't know it. They just repackaged the pill. Now, I've given you that example because I don't want you to go away thinking that direct marketing is good and pure because it's direct, because it's obvious, everything's fine. We can laugh at this stuff. Isn't it funny? We're not that stupid. But you didn't know what I just told you, did you? And nor did the women who were taking Seraphim know they were taking Prozac. So direct marketing is problematic. But I don't want to focus too much on direct marketing today because I want to actually focus on something that is even more problematic and that's its more clandestine alternative, what we will call indirect marketing. And here's a definition of what it means. A form of financial influence that invariably operates by proxy and or purposeful default via the financial sponsoring of persons, institutions or apparatuses deemed sympathetic and or potentially advantageous to the expansion of psychopharmaceutical markets. So what I want to do now is give you three examples, just three out of a plethora, uh, of how indirect influence actually works. The first example I want to give you is perhaps the most obvious example. And this occurs by way of industry financially sponsoring what are called key opinion leaders. These are senior members of the medical or psychiatric profession who get paid and will do and say things consistent with industry interests. And to get a sense of how common these financial conflicts of interests are, uh, a couple of years ago, a, a respected uh, watchdog charity in the United States, in fact, one of the most respected in the US, called ProPublica, um, looked at all of the payments that were made from the whole of the pharmaceutical industry to the whole of medicine. And what they found was that half of the highest payments made by the whole of pharma to the whole of US medicine were made to doctors in a single speciality. And that was psychiatry. So psychiatry was taking more of the higher payments than any other area of medicine. Another example, when researchers at the University of Massachusetts inspected the financial interests of the people who sat in and, and helped construct uh, the DSM, uh, DSM-4, uh, this is what they found, and this is the piece of research I'm, I'm, I'm alluding to here by Cosgrove. What they found was that 56% of the people who were involved on the advisory panels and the consultancy groups for the construction of DSM-4, 56% of them had one or more financial uh, tie to the pharmaceutical industry. And then get this, on the panels that considered the disorders for which drugs are the first line of treatment, 100% had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Now this form of influence is so powerful due to how typical and routine it has become within the psychiatric profession, a typicality that has seemingly inoculated many to the depths of the biasing effects. An example of this was, was dramatically illustrated to me um, a few years ago in the Houses of Parliament. There was a debate around at DSM and Alan Francis had been invited to it and during that I decided to point out to him how many people on his DSM-4 had financial conflicts of interest with respect to the pharmaceutical industry and his response was this well you know I know what you're saying James but ultimately we were all real good guys that was the phrase used we were good guys we were just trying to do what we thought was best but I have to admit it was remiss of DSM-4 not to have a conflict of interest policy at that uh, time. Well, following DSM-4, uh, DSM-5 uh, did have a conflict of interest policy, and the reason for that 
was post DSM-4, medicine became more and more concerned about financial ties to industry and there was a lot more pressure for them to be transparent and there was certainly a lot of pressure on DSM-5 to be more transparent regarding its tri uh, ties. So it was more transparent. So let's have a look at what um, we can find. Of the 29 members of the DSM-5 task force, the people who wrote and put it, the manual together, 21, it turns out, had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry, including the chair of the DSM task force, David Cuffer, and the vice chair, Daryl Ryger. Now, while, of course, those possessing financial ties to industry often dismiss or downplay their biasing effects, and I, I should know this because I've interviewed so many of them, the research is very clear that they bias those receiving them, both individuals and institutions, towards favouring psychopharmaceuticals in their clinical, educational and research activities. In other words, such payments bias clinicians, researchers and institutions in industry-friendly directions. Now, given that DSM uh, medicalize huge swathes of poor, painful normality, driving up drug prescriptions as a consequence, it's concerning that those responsible for the creation of DSM were at the same time receiving money from industry. They're going to be less concerned about one of the major consequences of over-medicalization than somebody like me, who wouldn't ever take money from uh, industry. So that's the first and most obvious example of how indirect influence works. But let me now give you uh, another example by bringing things slightly closer to home. And I'm going to do that now by referring to, uh, and by the way, here's the research, some of the research, there's an, an awful lot out there, but some of the research into the biasing effects of such conflicts of interest. I want to now refer you to these two documents used in the NHS. Now, these are two of the most powerful documents in mental health. And the reason for that is because these two documents have been used for the last uh, 15 years throughout primary care to help doctors determine whether or not the people sitting in front of them have either anxiety or depression. It's depression is PHQ-9, anxiety uh, is uh, GAD-7. So you give these to your patient, they tick some boxes, and depending on the score they get determines the intervention you, um, you offer. Now, one of the very interesting things about these documents, and one of the most powerful arguments against them, is that they set the bar very low for what constitutes having a form of depression or anxiety for which a drug should be prescribed. And by the way, 90% of people who fill in these questionnaires get prescribed medications as a consequence. Now what the tens of millions of people who have filled in these questionnaires in the NHS and have got prescribed drugs as a consequence almost certainly did not know was that these documents were developed by, their distribution throughout the NHS was paid for by, and their copyright was owned by Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, which incidentally makes two of the most prescribed anti-anxiety and antidepressant drugs in the NHS. So here you have a company setting the bar very low for what constitutes needing a drug well, at the same time as manufacturing and profiting from those drugs. And this has been going on within the NHS for 15 years. In fact, if you go onto Google, if any of you are online now, and you type in sort of depression, um, uh, NHS, etc., nine times out of ten, you're going, to, you're going to find the PHQ-9 coming up first, and that's the, the document you have to fill in to assess whether or not you have depression, and if so, how severely. Okay. So another example of how industry indirectly is promoting over-medicalization and as a consequence over-prescribing. 
Can I give you the third and final example now? This concerns uh, a personal anecdote. So, uh, 12 months after um, DSM-5 was published in May 2013, actually it wasn't 12 months, it was six months, excuse me. Six months after, I was in New York City and I was in one of those Airbnb apartments. I was up on uh, the upper uh, end of near Columbia University in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of these apartments one evening and I'm checking my emails and I decided to go online and actually look up, you know, what's going on in the publishing market, what books are selling well in the United States at the moment. So I go to Amazon and I open the page and I stop. And I look and I can't believe what I'm seeing. At that point, six months after DSM-5 was published, the highest selling book in the whole of the United States was DSM-5. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, Harry Potter, yeah, very popular. I have two little kids and they're really into it at the moment. Very, uh, this was the time when Harry Potter was really big. Harry Potter was at number seven. Fifty Shades of Grey, some of you may know that one. Number nine, again, very popular. DSM-5 was number one. But in addition to that, guess how much a paperback version of DSM-5 cost, the cheapest version? $88 a copy. So who was buying this book? Right? Who's buying it? So the next day, I'm interviewing a prominent medical anthropologist at New York University. We do our interview, and at the very end, and she works in mental health, so she knows the system very well, I asked her um, what was going on. I said, I've been online last night, I, I found out this information, what's going on? And she stopped and she said, James, you don't know. And I said, well, no, tell me what I don't know. And she said, from my experience in the New York State area where I work in primary care, uh, what's happening is the pharmaceutical industry is buying DSM in bulk and then distributing it for free to clinicians up and down the country. And that is why the sales are so high. Why would industry do that? It just makes complete business sense. The more people who are being medicalized, the greater the market you have for your own products. Now, I tried to verify this, so I contacted Amazon. They would not declare who was buying the books. They're not legally obliged to do so. Uh, so when I went to the American Psychiatric Association, I tried surreptitiously to discover what had been going on, and I got confirmation that the vast majority of DSM sales were bought in bulk. When I asked who was buying them in bulk, the door immediately uh, shut, uh, and I couldn't find it. So I haven't been able to get definitive uh, proof of this, but given everything else we know, I'll leave it for you to make up your, for yourselves, your own minds, the extent to which this is going uh, on. And indeed, it is absolutely consistent with what industry has been doing in relation to psychiatry over, over the last 20 years or so. And I just want to read very quickly this, this paragraph to summarise a lot of points and the research relating to the points being made. The pharmaceutical industry has been a major financial sponsor of UK and US academic psychiatry, significantly influencing psychiatric research, training and practice. This influence has been exerted through many heads of psychiatry departments receiving departmental income from drug companies, while at the same time as receiving uh, personal income. Through nearly all clinical trials into psychiatric drugs, antidepressants, neuroleptics, tranquilizers, being pharmaceutically uh, financed or, or commissioned, through most academic drug researchers receiving research funding, consultancy fees, speakers fees or other on area from industry and through leading psychiatric organisations such as the American Psychiatric Association, the publisher of DSM, receiving most of its operational costs from industry. E.g. with such support, the APA's annual revenues rose from 10.5 million in 1980 to 50.2 million by 2000. So, to bring this closer to home, um, in 2012, I did a freedom of information request to our eight leading psychiatry departments, university departments 
in the UK to see how much money they were receiving from industry. Uh, one of the departments simply uh, failed to respond to the question, uh, and two of the departments um, had simply not gathered any data at all. So I only got information regarding four of our leading psychiatry departments, and this is how much money they received for research funding alone, only research funding from industry between 2009 and 2012, 5.5 million from the University of Newcastle, 1.59 million from the University of Edinburgh, 687,000 from Oxford, and Institute of Psychiatry, 1.87 million. This doesn't sound like a lot of money, actually, to many people, it may not, but it is. For academics, this is a lot of money. You can pay for salaries, you can pay for PhD students, pay for seminars, etc. and so forth. For an academic department, this is a lot of money. But by the way, this only relates to the research funding being received. Private industry income uh, received by faculty isn't gathered by the university, so money for consultancy work, speakers fees and other honoraria, as British universities are simply not obliged to gather this information. This is what Liverpool University stated. Psychiatrists are not required to report individual payments to the university, so we don't hold any information which could be provided in response to this part of the request. But even if universities commit to gathering this information, I identified irregular reporting. One prominent um, psychiatry department stated their faculty had received no payments at all, despite a clear obligation uh, to do so if they had received such payments and despite three of its senior psychiatrists having reported receiving payments. So I went on to their published research. It was clear they had reported their payments. They hadn't reported those to their uh, university, even though they were obliged to do so. The important point I'm trying to make here is that through the era of psychopharmaceutical expansion, Neither universities nor any other private or public body in the United Kingdom has been legally obliged to declare the names of individual psychiatrists and the precise levels of industry income they receive each year. And this is concerning given such payments have demonstrable biasing effects on both clinical research and practice. They foster professional industrial dependencies and allegiances and in the case of speakers' fees and consultancy fees and other honoraria, these payments are seen by pharmaceutical companies as investments from which a measurable return is expected. They don't just give this money out for nothing. They give it out for an effect. And if an individual doctor isn't delivering, then the money will be taken away and it will be given to a doctor who is. And there's lots of documentary evidence supporting this. These are investments from which a return is expected. And yet, doctors do not have to report their financial conflicts of interest to any agency or any authority in the UK. It's absolutely, in my view, unacceptable. That pharmaceutical companies have actively used these extensive financial ties to shape practice and ideology within the mental health field, driving up prescription rates as a consequence, this should surprise no one. But the extent to which such companies have promoted increased prescribing by corrupt means is still not fully appreciated. So I'd like to focus very briefly on this issue now by drawing upon a case study. And by the way, I've just got about 10 minutes left before we can you know, finally have our, our, our Q&A. But I just want to focus on a case study because I think it's quite illustrative of some of the problems we encounter in this area. In May 2000, uh, Dr. Charles Schultz, a psychiatrist at the very height of his powers, walks up to a podium at the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association and announces a breakthrough in anti-psychotic drug research. The breakthrough amounts to the development of a new drug that has, quote, dramatic benefits over its competitors. Its name is Seroquel, and because of its superiority, quote, patients must receive these medications first. Two months before this commanding announcement was made at the APA and to the national media, the pharmaceutical company that manufactures Seroquel, AstraZeneca, was in disarray. 
They had just discovered that further research into Seroquel had revealed that the drug was far less effective than its arch rival drug, a drug called Haldol. The document containing this finding was being circulated among senior staff at the company who were now not quite sure what to do. An internal email written at the time and later released by the company during litigation captures the mood very well. So this is the email going around. Jeff and Mike, here's the analyses I got from Emma. I've also attached a message I sent to her yesterday asking for clarification. The data don't look good. In fact, I don't know how we can get a paper out of this. My guess is that we all, including Schultz, saw the good stuff and then thought further analyses would be supportive and that the paper was in order. But what seems to be, was to be the case is that we were highlighting only the good stuff and that our own analysis now supports the view out there that we are less effective than Haldol and our competitors. Once you've had a chance to digest this, let's get together or teleconference and discuss where to go from here. We need to do this quickly because Schultz needs to get a draft ready for the APA and he needs any additional analyses we can give him well before then. So the, this is the company thinking, you know, what are we going to do? And look at the relationship between Schultz, the psychiatrist who's going to present it as an independent academic at an APA academic conference. Look at the relationship between him and the company here. So in this email, the publications manager at AstraZeneca casts about for a solution. He knows the research into Seroquel doesn't look good. Yet he also realises that Schultz has to present a paper on Seroquel at the American Psychiatric Association's meeting in two months' time. If Schultz reports the negative data, the drug is presumably doomed. A way out is needed and fast. So what does the company do? How in just two months does it move from privately despairing over the failings of Seroquel to making a public declaration about its exceptional advantages? Does the company rapidly undertake a new study that finally secures Seroquel's superiority? Does it reanalyze the old data only to discover that its previous negative interpretation was wrong? The company does neither. There is no time. And even if there were time, the existing data is definitive. The drug is weaker than its competitors in many areas. That, it seems, is plain for all to see. At this point, you'd probably expect the company to cut its losses and with regret to publish the whole truth. But the company does not take that route. Presumably, there's too much money at stake. And anyway, perhaps there's another way out. Sure, it's not an ideal route to take or even an honest one, but given the money that could be lost, it has to be worth a go. The company therefore opts for a strategy known in drug research as cherry picking. In other words, it picks and publishes the data that makes the drug look effective while leaving aside the data that does not. And this was the solution that AstraZeneca opted for in early 2000. Rather than admitting that after a year on Seroquel, patients suffered more relapses and worse ratings on various symptom scales than patients on Haldol, not to mention gaining an average of five kilograms in weight, which put them at an increased risk of diabetes, the company rather honed in on one shred of positive data about the drug faring slightly better on some measures of cognitive functioning. And it was on the basis of these data that public claims were made that Seroquel has, quote, greater efficacy than Haldol, a fact hopefully leading physicians to, quote, better understand the dramatic benefits of newer medications like Seroquel. The company had favoured the practice of cherry picking for some time. Indeed, in the following email, again internal, again released during litigation, we hear how cherry picking had been used in a previously buried trial called Trial 15. Again, going among the senior echelons of the company. Please allow me to join into the fray. There has been a precedent set regarding cherry picking of data. This would be the recent Veligan presentations of cognitive functioning data from Trial 15, one of the buried trials. 
Thus far, I'm not aware of any repercussions regarding interest in the unreported data. That does not mean that we should continue to advocate this practice. There is growing pressure from outside the industry to provide all data uh, resulting from clinical trials conducted by the industry. Thus far, we have buried trials 15, 31, 56, and now considering COSTA. The largest issue is how do we face the outside world when they begin to criticise us for suppressing data? One could say that our competitors indulge in this practice. However, until now, I believe we have been looked upon by the outside world favourably with regard to ethical behaviour. We must decide if we wish to continue to enjoy this distinction. Obviously, AstraZeneca decides not to plunge for the ethical option. Rather, it continues to risk its reputation and the health of patients by cherry-picking the positive data and burying the negative data to sell the advantages of Seroquel over Haldol. This finally backfired in 2010, when so many people taking Seroquel were suffering from such awful side effects that about 18,000 of them were officially claiming that the company had lied about the risks of the drug. These claims were finally vindicated in 2010 when AstraZeneca paid out $125 million to settle a class action out of court for defrauding the public. But, you know, this isn't, this isn't an outlier. Let me very quickly run through a few, a few other case studies just to, just to let you know before we finish. I'm running out of time. GlaxoSmithKline, its drug Paxil and Siroxat did three trials. One trial showed mixed results. Another trial showed that it was no more effective than a placebo, and trial three suggested the placebo was actually more effective with certain children. <laughs> but this is children, by the way. Let's just, so the company published only the most positive study, publicly declaring that the drug is effective for major depression in children. Company officials actively suppressed negative results from one study because, as they said, it would be commercially unacceptable to include a statement that the efficacy had not been demonstrated, as this would undermine the profile of paroxetine. There was a lawsuit filed against GlaxoSmithKline in 2004. GSK settled out of court two months later when the company paid $2.5 million for charges of consumer fraud, a meagre sum considering that GlaxoSmithKline made $4.97 billion in worldwide sales from the drug in 2003 alone. By the way, this is a drug for children. Forest Laboratories, charged by the US Justice Department for defrauding the government of millions of dollars for hiding a clinical study showing that their antidepressants, Selexa and Lexapro, were not effective in children and might even pose dangerous risks to them. At worst, these risks included causing some children to become suicidal. Prosecutors said that by failing to disclose the negative results, which they buried, Forrest had kept crucial information hidden from physicians and from the wider public, preventing them from having all the information they require to make right treatment decisions for young children. Pfizer, Roboxetin, marketed as a Dronax by the drug giant, our friend Pfizer again is no more effective at countering major depression than a placebo sugar pill. Pfizer withheld negative trials from publication on 74% of the patients the article surveyed were actually left unpublished. Authors concluded um, in the BMJ that if the excluded data had been included, the evidence would have showed that the risks of taking the drug far exceeded the benefits. Yet Roboxetin has been approved for marketing in many European countries since 1997 and is still being taken by thousands of patients in the UK today. Finally, New England Journal of Medicine 2008, this article reviewed uh, 70 of the major clinical trials into antidepressant and it, uh, and it asked how many of these trials had been published. The answer, 38 showed positive results for antidepressants, slightly better outcomes compared to placebos and nearly every one of these positive studies had been published by the companies that undertook them. 36 studies actually showed negative results. Out of these, a full 22 had been buried, that is, never published. 11 had been published in a way to convey a positive outcome, and only three had been published accurately. Conclusion, a total of 33 negative studies had either been buried or manipulated to convey a positive outcome. 
So to bring things to a conclusion, one final paragraph. Of course, where psychopharmaceuticals genuinely help people, they may have some currency. However, research has also shown that the safety and efficacy of psychiatric drugs in particular has been exaggerated by both industry and those professionals whom industry funds. And that growing consumption of such drugs has been less driven by their clinical success than by good marketing concealing bad science, the manipulation and burying of neg negative clinical trials data, lacks medicines regulation, and I've said nothing about that today, but that's a whole other story, the uh, poor provision for non-drug alternatives, strong financial allegiances between industry and psychiatry, and the aggressive medicalization of everyday human distress. In short, the argument that psychopharmaceutical promotion has placed sufferers' needs before those of its shareholders is very, very difficult to substantiate. And I will leave uh, the presentation there, and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Yeah, okay, well, we'll just, um, you know, autism is an interesting category because the, the research basis for, for um, the neurobiology of autism is probably stronger than for any other area. Um, and it's a very involved literature, and, I, and, you know, to be honest with you, to go into all of that now would be rather difficult. I suppose all I'd say is that Alan Francis, who created uh, DSM-4, and who included the diagnosis of Asperger's, which is essentially a, a mitigated form of, a, of, 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 of autism, um, argued that by including that mitigated form of, of autism, more and more people got um, medicated unnecessarily. So his conclusion was by expanding the definition of autism to capture these, these you know, very mild versions of certain characteristics that certain people have labelled as characteristic of autism, we, we, we expanded the drug epidemic. Um, so that would be his argument, and I think he's probably right in that respect. By the way, autism no longer exists. It was abolished by DSM-5. So people who have autism don't really have it anymore, um, <laughs> apparently. So, um, that, that was interesting. Do you remember, remember also uh, homosexuality, right? You know, um, that was a psychiatric disorder until 1974, and then post-1974, um, it ceased to be one. And, um, you know, everyone, know that, you know if, you're, if you're homosexual today, then you, you're okay now. You're not, you're, not, you're not suffering from a psychiatric condition. But, you know, that, that, I think it's quite illustrative, the cultural processes behind decisions as to whether or not to keep things in or out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, well, no, no, this is, this is a highly contested area. I mean, one of the, the most common arguments that we heard in the early 20, uh, 2000s was the chemical imbalance theory of depression. You know, it wasn't championed as a theory. Uh, it was championed as a clinical truth, a fact, a biological fact. Uh, the fact of the matter is, uh, it's been disproven. Uh, and no credible neurobiologist would subscribe to the notion that depression is caused by a deficiency in serotonin. It's just gone. The Royal College of Psychiatrists last year publicly disavowed the theory after, after much lobbying. Um, so um, we've moved on from that. Um, there's not to say there's a biological element in, in depression. Of course there is. Um, there's a biological accompaniment to any state of mind. The question is, is whether or not there's a dysfunction that can be traced as the cause of something called depression. And thus far, uh, there is no evidence for that. Yep. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, there's a gentleman at the back there. I'm just trying to reconcile um, how Seroquel is not effective, but also antipsychotics don't do what they say on the tin. So is that that as a tranquilizer or sedative or stimulant, whatever it is, it's not as strong, or the side effects are just less? 
Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. I mean, I suppose what I meant by that phrase is that um, there, there was an argument made that psychiatric drugs cure or remedy uh, biological malfunctions um, of varying sorts. So the, 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 the medical model was recruited to explain the drug action of psychopharmaceuticals. And it turns out that that particular model is incorrect. And Joanna Moncrief, uh, a psychiatrist at UCL, has pr proposed an alternative, which is called the drug-centered model. Uh, psychiatric medications alter people's states of mind. Absolutely true. You know, no, one, no one's going to dispute that, which may or may not be experienced by those individuals in question as positive. Some people experience them as positive, and we have to honor that and, and respect that, but a lot of people don't experience them that way. A lot of people experience them as harmful. And we need to pay more attention to that group of the, of, the, of, of the patient population. So it was really to contest the traditional understanding of drug action um, as something correcting an imbalance. Uh, that is not the case. Um, I think we should uh, follow Joanna Moncrief personally in, in her particular perspective on this topic. The Seroquel just had not as good outcomes for the people who took it. Like, they just didn't like it as much. Uh, yeah, well, well, in this case, it was side effects. It was the, the, the um, adverse drug effects that um, people were experiencing, which they weren't warned they were going to experience because the necessary data had been buried by the company. That was the problem in that case. Yeah. Um, the gentleman here. Yeah. It's a brilliant case you uh, expressed. What would you propose to correct this? Yeah, well, there is, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, um, there, are a lot, there are lots of different things that can be done. I mean, going back to the DSM, um, and I, it is a very good question, actually, because it's a pragmatist question, and that's what matters in this area. Um, the DSM, there's there an element to the DSM I'm quite sympathetic towards. I mean, I think it's fundamentally human to want to categorise uh, experience. You know, we've classified experience since time immemorial. Anthropologists uh, have documented the, the various ways in which different societies across the globe partition um, different features of the natural world, different species of bird and animal, etc. Classifying phenomena is a fundamentally human experience, and I think you know doing that with respect to different species of emotional suffering makes sense. Um, however. That's not what the DSM only does. The DSM does something more than that. What it does, it then pronounces upon the meaning of the experience it classifies, calling it dysfunction, disorder, disease. In other words, it brings to these classifications the medical philosophy it claims to derive from them. It assumes to be the case what it should rather demonstrate to be the case, that these different patterns of suffering indicate disorder and disease. There is no evidence to support that. That is a cultural move, that is an interpretive move, which is hugely problematic in my view. A lot of the experiences captured by DSM are just natural and normal, again, painful uh, reactions to living in a difficult world. And that's not to undermine the severity of these experiences. It's, you know, you can suffer deeply acutely as a consequence of the traumatic things you've been subject to. That isn't a disordered reaction. That's a fundamentally human, natural reaction. I don't think it's doing anyone any favours by calling it illness, dysfunction. I think it's very stigmatising, actually. I think the medical model is more responsible for stigma in society than anything else. We've been led to believe the origins of stigma reside in a benighted public who are prejudiced against people who suffer. I think that prejudice, if there is any, to the extent it exists, has been exacerbated by the models of distress that have been foisted upon us over the last 30 years. So yes to some kind of classificatory system, but a demedicalized classificatory system that also recognizes the extent to which patterns of suffering uh, are culturally situated. They change over time. An excellent example of this is self-harming behavior. Back in the 1970s, uh, clinically speaking, this was very rarely encountered because self-harming behaviour wasn't the kind of style of suffering that people unconsciously selected to communicate their distress. It wasn't around, but from the 1990s onwards, suddenly people start to select this behaviour unconsciously as a communicative mechanism. Think of hysteria back in the early 20th century, very similar. 
it was the epidemic problem, and then it disappears. Think of anorexia nervosa in the early uh, 90s in Japan, uh, in Hong Kong, excuse me. There were very few cases of it. By the end of the 90s, it was at the epidemic levels. It was to do with the ways in which people were being socialised to think about their distress and socialised to communicate it. So a category system that, that is non-medical, that recognises cultural specificity and that patterns of suffering change. Something like that, yeah, I, I'd, I'd go for. But I don't think that's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> uh, that's just with DSM and I could talk about pharma as well, but maybe I've said enough and for now. Um, who shall I go for? Oh, lady. Just a bit of a different question. Yeah. With all the interviews you did, I'm interested to know your opinion on the uh, Brexit vote. Because it's quite Yeah, that's a very good question. I, I, I was astonished the extent to which they were honest. And I remember calling my wife and, and saying, you wouldn't believe what Rob, Robert Spitz has just said. Um, I, I was really surprised. And I think what I quickly learned was that there's a huge disjunct between what the people who sat on these committees thought about the process and how this process was represented by the private corporation the American Psychiatric Association, which incidentally uh, makes a lot of its operational costs, funds a lot of its operational costs from publication of DSM. DSM makes the APA about $6 million a year in publication uh, um, revenue. And the APA had a vested interest in representing this as a piece of science, whereas the people on the committees were quite clear that it was a hugely problematic endeavour, an important endeavour, as they believed, an endeavour that would improve the state of psychiatric diagnosis, improve its reliability, etc. and so forth, but not to the extent that it was being represented by the APA. So I think what I encountered was what the APA had sort of covered over um, uh, and led people to believe didn't exist. And could I give you another example of how the APA does this? Um, I wanted to speak to the people who wrote DSM-5. So I contacted the, contacted the APA and said, could I do so? I want to understand the processes that went on behind the scenes, as I did with DSM-3 and DSM-4. And it turns out that I wasn't allowed to speak to anyone involved in DSM-5 because all of them were uh, uh, asked to sign confidentiality agreements prohibiting them from speaking to anybody, any academic, any journalist, about what went on behind the scenes in the construction of DSM-5. So I said, well, can I just consult the archives then? You know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a researcher. And they said, oh, we can't do that either. And I said, well, why not? Because they've all been embargoed for 20 years post-publication. So we cannot work out what went on behind the scenes. And so the APA has a vested interest in keeping this hidden, and I think what I discovered was that when you get behind the scenes, things look a little different to how they've been represented. Yeah. Just time for one more question, James. Oh, uh, so there's a man, at, so I, can't, I, I can't see you clearly, I don't know who it is, but there's, a big, there's an arm at their back, yeah. Sorry, I, I, I'm sorry, I, okay. I couldn't hear. Um, to do with antidepressants and then connected with blood pressure, which often goes together, um, then the thing of having high potassium, too high potassium as a result of long-term taking an antidepressant and a blood pressure pill. So, you know, then you get <clears throat> high potassium. Yeah, which yeah. is pretty frightening. But yeah. That's what the, these things do. Yeah, I, I think the long term, the effects of taking the medications long term, um, we're finally now beginning to discover. Uh, and, and the situation doesn't look good. Let us remember that these drugs were approved for public use on the basis of clinical trials that only followed people on the medication for around eight weeks. Yeah. All the clinical trials that. Really? Yeah, yeah. Um, demonstrate efficacy were trials between eight to twelve weeks. Okay, 
So I don't know if you remember the Cipriani meta-analysis published in 2018. There was lots of coverage saying antidepressants work, and this, all this sort of stuff. Well, actually, what that analysis showed was that they work almost hardly better than placebos for the most severely distressed members of societies. And actually, you could explain away that difference in terms of the drug effects producing side effects that boost the placebo effect, etc. But also what that headlining didn't report was that the studies surveyed in that meta-analysis were between 8 and 12 weeks long. So they told us nothing about the vast majority of people taking antidepressants in the UK today who aren't taking them for 8 or 12 weeks. You prescribe them for at least 6 months. So we're in a situation where we're engaging in a vast public experiment with more and more people taking these drugs for longer and longer and we really still don't know the extent to which that this kind of prescribing is harming people. But the evidence we're getting in already is indicating it is, it is problematic, very problematic. So um, what can the public do about that? Uh, <laughs> it's another... <laughs> Well, well, just finally, and, I, and I've been told this is the last question, and I, I, I should stop, and I'm sorry to those I've been unable to, to, to answer. Uh, what the publisher did, well, we need brave journalists, don't we? Um, we need brave journalists um, covering this kind of thing. We need brave clinicians and academics speaking up about it. Um, uh, we need greater regulation of links between pharma and psychiatry. Um, and we've outlined, in fact, we've, I, I, I co-founded an organisation uh, by the way, we don't make any mo money from this organisation. It's operating costs we pay for out of our own pocket. Uh, so I'm promoting this organisation now because it's an organisation that disseminates information to the public we think they should have. There's no money involved at all. We've never made a... I've lost a lot of money by way of this organisation, by the way. But I'm going to promote it now to you. It's called the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. Oh, sorry. Um, can you hear me? Um, the it's called the Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. I get to plug it four or five times now. The Council for Evidence-Based Psychiatry. <laughs> yeah, and, and we, um, we, we've put on a website. We've put lots of information online for people. We have a Twitter account, and we, we, we regularly tweet things we think are important around issues of mental health. We're a very critical organisation. We comprise uh, uh, academics, psychiatrists, um, pharmacologists, etc. We're all united in the belief that uh, we are dramatically overprescribing these medications and underestimating the extent to which they can cause people, people harm. So, if you, uh, so what I'm going to say to you is I'll refer you, because I don't have time to answer the question, I'll refer you to the website and there'll be information on there and, and follow us on our Twitter feed. We actually don't have that many followers so if we get a few after today I'd be really pleased. Um, but I, I better stop there. If other people want their questions addressed please come and, come and see me now. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you.